Oh, this is embarrassing. For who? TT? It ain't you freaking against the ice machine with a random woman. It's it's Ollie. And Ollie gotta see it today. Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky would be our Gold Coast Wooden Bangle Bundle. I only have two sets outside of the set that I have. So if you like it, go on over there and check it out. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. Now, let's continue to talk about, ooh, TT's Deliver Us From Temptation, the tragic and shocking story of the Temptations and Motown. It was a year of broken links in the chain that had held us all together through thick and thin and of escalating tensions between two groups of temps, whose links had long ago been broken. Of course, there was nothing new in the animosity between Otis Williams and Eddie Kendrick. A deep hatred had existed between them for years. The way Eddie saw it, the temptations had always been two separate groups. Otis and Melvin's group, the distance, and Eddie and Paul's group, the primes. So it was no surprise when in December 1989, our group of former temps went to perform in Los Angeles where the other temps were living and Otis and Melvin didn't show their faces for any of the shows. However, Ollie Woodson and Ron Tyson from Otis's group of imitations did show up at one of the performances with a few hanger-ons and requisite girls. And from the way they carried on, anyone might have thought that the only reason they were there was to steal the show from their arch rivals. As the show neared its end, Eddie foolishly but graciously invited Ollie and Ron to join in a number. They jumped up from the audience like two jacks in a box. Ollie thrust his cellular phone into my hands for me to hold, and the two imitations got up on stage, almost pushing the background singers off. Once they were there, it seemed like they had forgotten how to get off stage. They did the entire medley of hits with Eddie, David, and Dennis. And when the medley was over, they just stood there, basking in the applause and waiting to join in the closing number. I kept waiting for them to take their bows and go sit the fuck down. If that didn't happen, I was hoping that Eddie would show them to their seats or that Ollie's phone would finally ring so I could go drag his skinny butt off the stage. But Eddie didn't say a thing, and nobody called Ollie. Man, I like Ollie. Treat her like a lady. Later, we all returned to the hotel with Ollie and Ron tagging along. During the course of the evening, Dennis asked me to bring some ice to his suite. I went out into the hallway, which arranged in a U-shape around the atrium. Child, he said he went around there to get Dennis some ice, okay? And he hearing grunting and moaning and shit, right? Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Child, it turned out that it was Ollie and some random woman freaking up against the ice machine. You know, he's saying to himself, oh, this is embarrassing. For who? T.T., it ain't you. Freaking against the ice machine with a random woman, it's, it's Ollie, okay? And Ollie got to see it today. When's the next time he going to get the opportunity to just randomly freak a woman up against the ice machine? Later on that night, David called me up and said, Tony, give me the keys to the car. I need to pick up some things from the all-night drugstore. Now, nobody really wanted David driving the luxury rental car alone. 
Not only did he have no driver's license and drove like a maniac, the car was leased in Eddie's name and for no Never, 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 no, no, so no. My number one rule is, okay, can't anybody and everybody drive my car. That's not going to happen. My car is not the best car in the world, but it's my mother. And if you can't afford to fix it without me calling my insurance, you can't drive. I know that because you asking to drive my car and not going down to the enterprise and renting a car. So, no, you can't drive my car. If we don't live in the same household, no. would nobody drive that car but me. Me, okay? Because ninjas get real reckless with your money and your name. Whenever people talk about how they put something in somebody else's name, I be saying to myself, well, why didn't you ask them why they can't put it in their name? My credit is messed up. Well, if your credit is messed up with the Equifax, then your credit is messed up with me too. So I quickly came up with some reason for my friend Charles, who sometimes travel with me, to accompany him. Girl, your friend Charles? Girl, so you can tell everybody else's tea, but you can't say that Charles is your knock around? Okay, girl. You don't mind if Charles goes along too, do you? I asked David. I need him to get me some toiletries for you guys. I was sound asleep when what seemed like hours later, Charles came back. What took you so long, I asked him. You won't believe it, he answered, looking astonished. I sat up in bed. It seemed that David had taken off like a bat out of hell and driven directly and recklessly to one of the worst neighborhoods in Los Angeles where he parked outside an all-night drugstore. I'm going in to get my asthma medication, he told Charles. You wait here and then you can go in after I come back. I don't want to leave this car alone around here. It sounded sensible. Charles waited and waited and waited. Finally, he decided that he'd better lock up the car and go check out what was happening with David in the drugstore. He went inside. No David. David had slipped back out through the side door. Charles made his purchases and was just returning to the car when he saw David rushing up the street. Okay, David told him without the briefest explanation, get in the car, get in, let's go, quick, hurry. Well, when Charles told me the story, I was sure that David had given him the slip to go in search of a real drugstore, which didn't seem like the best recommendation for the drug rehabilitation center he had recently came out of. I started wondering if David, like Eddie, could ever live without drugs of one or another. So right here is where I have to take back what I said previously when I said that I don't know if Eddie was a drug user because up until this point, um, I've never heard T.T. mention Eddie using drugs. And in the book, T.T. describes Eddie as his own individual man who was not a uh, tag along to get along. So I interpreted that as he was not doing drugs. Maybe, so, you know, at this point, reading this part right here, I'm saying to myself, okay, maybe Eddie did do drugs, but it did not control his whole life. Let me say that, the way that David had lost his life to drugs. You know, maybe he was a casual user. I don't know, or maybe, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm not quite sure as to how to describe Eddie's drug use. On a personal level, Eddie appeared to need David more than even he knew because I was beginning to believe what he really wanted more than anything was to be able to do all those wild and crazy things David did. Okay, um, that again puts me in the mind frame of I, I don't know what to say about Eddie's drug use. Now. I started to understand all this about three weeks after the California tour, when the three former temps were in Indianapolis to do a couple of New Year's Eve performances at the Indiana Roof Ballroom next door to the Embassy Suites Hotel, where we were staying. The singers were booked on connecting flights throughout Detroit from Florida, but when they got to Detroit, they discovered that they were in for a long layover in the first class lounge because of bad weather conditions. David decided to leave the airport, even as deep Detroit snow was no threat to him. Some time later, when the flight was ready to take off, David had not yet returned. 
Everybody but David arrived in Indianapolis, did the sound check, and prepared for the show. David was still drifting around somewhere in Detroit. Dennis's wife, Beverly, had driven through the cold from their home in Dayton, Ohio. Dennis, as usual, when he was in tow, was busy walking on eggshells and acting like a scared little boy, trying to keep his on-the-road secrets from Big Mama. Meanwhile, Eddie was quietly simmering. Damn, that sound like them NBA dudes. You know, some of them basketball wives, they be like, okay, when you at home, you with me. But it's an understanding when they on the road, they for everybody. By the time David finally showed up, Eddie and Dennis were already up on stage and halfway through the first show. As instructed by Eddie, I had David's stage costume all ready for him in the dressing room, which was on a balcony level overlooking the main ballroom. I was still trying to get David to put on his socks when he announced as if it were an everyday thing. Oh, by the way, I'm going solo. When are you going solo? I dared to ask. I'm going solo to motherfucking night. What's wrong with you, bitch? Are you crazy? Oh! I would have had to get oh. that nigga. Oh, I would have had to get him. You ain't going to talk to me any old way talking about something. What's wrong with you? Is he crazy? Oh, I would have had to get that nigga. You ain't going to just be talking to me any old kind of way. I stopped trying to maneuver David's feet into his socks. You're going solo tonight? That's damn straight, he said. I'm sick of this group shit. He went on and on. I just figured it was the drugs and his weariness talking, so I paid him no mind and finished getting him ready. Man, what would I do to David Ruffin? Ooh, I would have to get that ninja back. You ain't finna talk to me any old kind of way like I'm your mammy. When we finally reached the stage area, I begged David, just rush onto the stage because it'll soon be midnight, you know? And everybody's going to expect you to be included in the Happy New Year's festivals and all that. Fuck you, he screamed. Don't you ever tell me when to go on stage, you motherfucking taskmaster diva bitch you. Oh! I've been in show business as long as you've been living and wearing makeup. And I know exactly when to hit that stage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, so David on stage doing David. Okay. Eddie doing Eddie. Eddie. Dennis doing Dennis. Okay. Now, the show is coming to an end. You know, the men grab their hands, lift it up, and then they bow down together. Eddie is displeased. The crowd went wild, but Eddie wasn't pleased at all. He snatched his hand away abruptly from David and left the stage. Dennis saw Eddie leaving and followed after him while David launched right into what he believed to be the start of his solo career. I had to race after Eddie and Dennis who were quickly making their way up the spiral staircase to the dressing room. Once there, Eddie immediately started stripping off his clothes like a wild man in heat and changing into his after show outfit. Tony, keep your mother hunchy godfather away from me. I don't want to be bothered with his bullshit tonight. I'm going up to my suite. I knew by now that if you were smart, you never took sides when Eddie and David were at odds with each other. That was an unwritten number one rule. If you did take sides, you never last. So I kept Eddie and David out of each other's way between shows that New Year's Eve. I was prepared for a big chill to set in between Eddie and David. We staff members were still expecting the worst. So there was a moment of definite but not shocked surprise when David put his arms around Eddie. Eddie wished him a happy new year and suddenly all was right with the world. By breakfast the next morning, everybody knew that David was surely not going out on a solo act and that everything would remain just as it was before. Before we go forward, right? So anyway, before we go forward, let's talk right quick about the Motown dynamic, right? When Sugar Ray, that would be Raynoma, Gordy, Singleton, Singleton or Singletary, something like that. When she said that it was a family dynamic, I really do believe it. Okay, now they might have been fucking, you know, each other also, but it was still a family dynamic. So this is the second example in this book that I see where David has been very aggressive, 
um, you know, been very forthright about his feelings. And then the next day or the next moment, it was smoothed over. So I do believe that just like in a regular family dynamic, when you have siblings that get into it and then the next day they plan with each other, that's the same way that it happens with the Motown family. It's just I too many episodes where you see them at each other, but they still love each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, even with Diana Ross and the Supremes, I don't think that Diana hated them. I just think that, like Aretha Franklin, she was the one that commanded the most attention. I emphatically believe that after all of David Ruffin's shenanigans and when he comes down off of his high, he's still a very loving brother. It was 1990. A new decade had begun and nobody knew or understood what it would bring. Soon after came one of the strangest episodes of my life with The Temptations, an episode that once again revolved around the great David Ruffin. Remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com for these gold hand-painted by me wood bangles. Now remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, have a good one.